All right. Well, here we are. Welcome. Hey, everyone who is tuning in to join us for our 57th live kitchen table conversation here with the Men and Masculine Folks Network. And this is a place and a, a conversation that we do every couple of weeks where we are really trying to shape new meanings of masculinity that are authentic, caring, and thoughtful. And today we are very, very excited to be welcoming in our friend Emiliano, uh, who is coming to us live from Texas. And we'll, we'll do some intros here in a few minutes. But today's conversation uh, is going to be focused around Sexual Assault Awareness Month, which is April every year. And it's a, it's a great time for us to really raise awareness of how that shows up in our communities, in our neighborhoods, uh, in our kids' schools, and, and really what can we as men and masculine folks do to not only learn about those dynamics, but also like begin to step forward and, and help change the narrative uh, about that so that we can prevent sexual violence and sexual assault from happening in our communities that we love so much. So before we dive in, I'll, I'll invite uh, Felix to do an intro. Uh, and again, my name is Sean Hayes. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I am coming to you live from Duluth, Minnesota at Menace Peacemakers. Hello, everyone. My name is Felix Martinez. My pronouns are he, him, and his, or él en español, in Spanish, and I'm reporting from Egan, Minnesota. Super excited to be here. Super excited to see Emiliano. It's been a while since so we've been since we were being able to talk, so uh, create, have this space to continue having a conversation and, and super excited to be here. So thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emiliano Diaz de Leon. My pronouns are he, him, his, el, in Espanol. Um, I'm the men's engagement specialist with the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault. You know, and I am participating from Austin, Texas, so I'm really happy to be with y'all um, you know, I've been really looking forward to this conversation. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate both of you. I'm a huge fan of Kitchen Table Talks, so I'm a little, I'm fanboying over here, just being on with you and being able to have this conversation about, uh, you know, sexual violence uh, awareness month. So it, it is really an honor to be with you all today. Well, yeah, thank you so much again for joining us. I know we've had this scheduled for a couple of weeks now, so I've been looking forward to it. And hey, Serrano, good to see you. We were just going through intros, so if you want to come off mute and introduce yourself, that'd be sweet. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So my apologies for being late. Um, my name is Serrano Robinson. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, yeah, and I work for Menace Peacemakers as well, and I'm uh, calling out of the loop right now, so glad to be here. Awesome. And who knows, we may have some more folks pop in and that'll be great. Uh, but again, yeah, we've really been looking forward to this conversation. And I know, you know, being that it's the beginning of April, you know, a lot of the sexual assault awareness month um, information and graphics and social media posts are starting to come out and we've been seeing those. Um, but maybe I was thinking before we sort of dive into that, Emiliano, um, would you be willing to sort of share a little bit about your story and how you got involved um, working in this field and, and what that has looked like in your life? No, oh, thank you, Sean. That's such a great question. And so I don't know, it's, it's great to see you. You know, like I was telling everybody, a huge fan. And so it's like, I'm so excited to to be on with both of, uh, with with all three of you and uh, to be to be here today. So, uh, yeah, it's a that's a great question. You know, I just celebrated 15 years with Tasa, which is <laughs> which is mind boggling. I was, you know, I was, it, it's really wild to think that I've been in this particular role and that Tasa has been um, dedicating my capacity, you know, to this particular issue. We've been doing engaging men work here at TASA at the statewide level for the last 15 years. I mean, that's, to me, that's really phenomenal. And over the last 15 years, that has incorporated male survivors of sexual violence, really um, ensuring that our rape crisis centers around the state of Texas have, you know, we're helping to build their capacity to provide services to male survivors of sexual violence. So it's been a significant part of the work that I've, that I've, that I've been able to do over the last decade. Um, 
but I feel really fortunate. I feel very privileged to work at TASA. Before I came to TASA, um, I was an advocate. So I was an immigrant rights legal advocate in South Texas and, uh, you know, in Harlingen and worked with an organization called Proyecto Libertad. Um, so, you know, it was a really unique experience because, of course, I've worked, you know, predominantly with the Latino community, predominantly with communities of color. Uh, as a victim advocate, and uh, and I had never really worked as a legal advocate before, so it was a really new experience for me. So I was doing legal advocacy work, and I also was, you know, organizing men in South Texas uh, through the Texas, uh, um, through the Men's Resource Center of South Texas. So I was doing that organizing work right before I came to TASA, but I was just reflecting on um, how long I've been sort of in the movement doing this work. It's been really for the last 27 years. So my entire my entire adult, adult life, uh, I have been engaged in this work. Um, and of course I started, I, I came to this work as a, a victim and survivor, um, and also as someone who perpetrated teen dating violence. So, uh, you know, I was very fortunate in my early teens to, ex to receive some intervention, which really was very transformative, really helped me heal from the violence and abuse I was experiencing at home. Um, as well as the abusive, really transform my abusive behavior. And as a result, um, you know, just got really inspired and really wanted to dedicate my life um, to this issue um, and really transforming masculinity, um, you know, and in, in really working towards a, a future without violence, right? So I think we're, we, 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 we all share that uh, in common, but I think for me, that work became, began very early as a teenager and uh, started as a volunteer and then was very fortunate in my early 20s to get hired as a victim advocate, a children's advocate. Um, and so that's really how I got started at SAFE in Austin. And, uh, you know, I've just been very fortunate, very blessed to be able to continue to do the work. But um, yeah, you know, so I, I address both the prevention side of things as well as the victim advocacy side of things. And I, I feel very fortunate that I'm able to lend my experience to, to both of those issues. And, um, you know, of course I coordinate the, the Texas Men Speak uh, project here in Texas. And we've been doing that particular project for the last three years. And, you know, the kitchen table talks is what really inspired us to do our Instagram lives that we have monthly. So, you know, we, we, we get on and we have these kinds of conversations and it was really the kitchen table talks that inspired that particular part of the project. Um, you know, and again, I'm, I'm just really happy to be with you today and um, to share a little bit about my story and just in terms of the work that we're doing here in Texas, um, because it really lends to the work um, that men as peacemakers is, are do, you know, that you have been doing for so long. And, um, you know, of course, I've, I've learned a great deal and I consider all of you, you know, friends, colleagues and mentors. And so it really, you know, it, it, it really is exciting to be with you this afternoon to have this conversation. Uh, I couldn't think of a more important time to, to your point earlier, Sean, to have this conversation at the beginning of April during Sexual Assault Awareness Month to specifically help to raise awareness about this issue um, and really to hopefully to speak to the male survivors in your audience um, and encourage them to come forward, to share their story, to, you know, to to report their, you know, to report the abuse uh, or to, you know, to begin their, their own healing journey. So, uh, yeah, I'm just really, really happy to be a part of this conversation today. Well, thank you so much again. And I know we're all pumped. Um, and, and I know I'm, you know, very much looking forward to learning, you know, from you um, a little bit more about, you know, what, what sexual assault is looking like these days. I mean, I think, I would say, you know, pre-COVID, there was sort of an idea I had in my mind of what that looks like, right, and how it shows up in communities and schools and, and all over in our communities. And so I'm very curious to kind of have a conversation about what does this look like now, now that we're sort of through COVID, now that things have really gone virtual in a lot of ways as well. And so how do we see that, you know, that type of violence showing up? Um, is it online? Is it in person? Um, is it a combination of both? Um, and so, you know, and I don't know if Felix and Serrano, if you have any other specific questions um, around that that you want to learn about. But um, yeah, just very excited to hear more because I think this stuff is happening a lot more than 
what we want to admit or um, realize. And it's, it's very easy to sort of sweep this kind of violence under the rug. Um, and then I also think that it's very easy for us to sort of like paint this picture of what rape might look like or mm. how we how we often see victims being blamed for those types of things. And so I'm, yeah, just very curious about, you know, wherever you want to take that. And then, you know, guys, feel free to, to yeah, jump please. in at any point. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. That's a, I think is, you know, it's a, it's a great, it's an important place to start just really helping us understand like what is currently happening. Uh, what, what is sexual violence, right? Um, I think for folks who are watching this live or who are watching this recording later on, I think, um, many folks who, who, you know, many folks who are watching are probably survivors themselves, right? Who have experienced some form of sexual violence. And we know just like with domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, et cetera, those things are sort of happen on a sort of a continuum. And so um, with, you know, we think of this continuum of sexual violence uh, on one end, we have, you know, uh, sexual harassment, the kinds of things that we're seeing um, in the workplace that we're seeing online, um, you know, that we're seeing on the street, Right. So I, I think if you talk to if you just talk to the girls, or women in your lives, they will share, unfortunately, many examples of experiencing sexual harassment almost on a daily basis. Right. So I, I think those those sorts of things that are that are still happening and they're happening virtually as well. Um, and so, you know, and then you have at the other end of the continuum, you have rape. Right. Which is the most, uh, you know, we're talking about violent sexual assault. Um, and so and then all the things that happen in between right that sort of lead from sexual harassment that lead to rape that are that are occurring whether it's you know um being forced being forced or or um you know being forced to 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 view pornography as an example sort of is on that continuum of being exposed or being groomed to be abused by an offender or offenders um, so, I mean, there are a lot of different forms of sexual violence that including that include that don't always include penetration or forced. And, and for, for folks who are watching, I'm just going to give you a little trigger warning um, to please take care of yourself, because I think when we talk about sexual violence, especially if you are a victim and survivor, it is really important that you take yourself. You don't have to watch this or you can watch it when you're ready or you can walk, walk, walk away from from this right now. But I think, um, unfortunately, too many people in our lives um have have had some of the these ex, these unwanted you know experiences right have been forced have been um you know whether they're children all the way to seniors in our life right there's no there there you know sexual violence affects people of all ages races social sexual orientations gender identities from every single background every single religion um so you know, there's not just a one victim. There, there are all kinds of victims, including boys and men. Um, you know, so I, I think the and unfortunately, it's it's a it's a significant problem in our communities. But the other thing that's really harmful about sexual violence is that usually the offenders or offenders uh, are people that we know and love or that we live with, right? And I think that's the hardest thing for us to acknowledge. To your point, Sean, and for us to talk about is that most of the time the person who is abusing us is someone that is known to the victim um, or survivor. It's a family member, a friend, it could be a neighbor, um, it could be a relative, but it tends to be somebody that, that is known to the victim. It's, you know, when we think about rape, when we think about sexual violence, we tend to think about like the offender or offenders are strangers. And th that does occur, but for for the majority of the cases that we that that, that are reported, <clears throat> the the offender tends to be somebody that is known to the victim, and I think that's what makes it so difficult for for us to talk about, for us to acknowledge, for those survivors to come forward. Um, you know, because again, those are scout leaders, they're pastors, they're you know they're they're leaders in our community. You know, um, they're uh, elected officials. I mean, they're, they're prominent individuals, right? They're people that have some sort of power, some privilege, um, some access, some authority, um, you know, and it really could, it could be anybody. The, the offender most of the time is a man, uh, a male identified person, uh, most of the time, but we know that, you know, that, 
the offender can also be girls and women, right? We have to acknowledge that 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 does occur, but the majority of time, it's usually a man that's the, you know that's why we think of this issue as a particular um, issue like that impacts men as well because it's usually men who are abusing other men, and so um, you know that's why it's so important that we have these conversations with the boys and men in our lives because. One in six boys have experienced some unwanted sex, like have had some like some unwanted sexual experience, you know, in their lifetime. So um, we all know, we all love, we all live with, we all worship with, we all we all work with, we go to school with somebody who has experienced sexual violence. This is the reality of the issue, um, and that's why it's so critical to have these conversations. Not just during April, right? It's great that we're raising awareness and that we're speaking out and. Uh, about this issue in April, but all the time, right? Like this has to, that's, you know, that's that's why, you know, ending sexual violence is our mission here at TASA, um, you know, because we believe that these conversations, we need to have these conversations all the time with each other, uh, with our children, with other men, uh, with women, with girls, uh, with seniors, like with folks in the military, like just et cetera, right? We need to have we need to have these conversations because unfortunately this issue is impacting all of us. Thank you, Emiliano, that's great information. Uh, as a Latino, uh, that's one of the reasons why I do the, the work that I do. It, it was because I didn't see leaders like me in my community trying to make a difference, to create awareness about these topics. And my question for you right now is, uh, why you, do you think it's important to engage with men and boys in this type of difficult conversations that other than places like this, you, you don't see them out, out there. You don't see friends having conversations about sexual assault, what we experience every single day. Uh, and also understanding that, you know, there's more good men than bad men, but most of good men are silent. So how do you engage in this conversation with them? Uh, can you provide us some tips so we can also learn ways to connect and our, you know, to our loved ones or, or friends and the communities that we live in? Oh, and that's just Felix. I think that's a great question. I think, you know, it just starts, it starts here, right? I think, you know, for folks who are watching, you know, this live or watching the recording, just share it with the men in your life, right? They just share it with the men in your life, the men on your social media that are following you. And, and have a conversation. What do you think, right? Like, what did you think about what Sedano said or Felix or Sean said about this issue, right? Like, you know, have a conversation uh, using these kinds of these kinds of tools, right? There's so many, you know, whether it's articles, you know, PSA, there's so many ways that we can engage and, you know, just sort of, you know, begin that conversation. So, it, because it can be, it can feel really scary, right? It's, it's, this is a hard conversation to have. For that reason, because we know that sometimes the people that we're going to talk to have been affected by sexual violence. They have a family member, a friend, a loved one, a classmate, a coworker that has, has experienced sexual violence. And so they've been impacted personally. And so we, we, we should all be invested in doing what we can to both prevent sexual violence and to, and to intervene when we believe that a situation is, is potentially leading to an act of sexual violence. Right. So I think we, we can talk with guys about the things that we can say and do when we are hearing or seeing something, whether it's on social media or whether it's like we're just hanging, you know, together, uh, we're walking down the street and a guy begins to whistle or, you know, uh, to, you know, sexually harass a woman like that, that that's the moment where we can where we can uh, intervene as bystanders or as as friends and say, hey, man, that's not cool. Like, we don't we just don't do that. That's not OK. Right. Clearly, you made her you made her uncomfortable. You actually, since it's like a group of us together, she's now scared. Right. And and so I, I think it's having those really honest conversations with each other, holding each other accountable, especially when we're engaging in behavior that's on that continuum um, and really calling those things out and calling brothers in, you know, and having having really like honest conversations where it's not like I'm going to shame you or blame you, but really where we're going to have a really honest conversation about how, you know, how problematic that is. And Hey man, maybe you didn't know, but my sister, you know, she, she experienced, she was, she was raped. She's a, she's a survivor. Right. So like when you do that, when you say that, like, 
you know, it's not, it's not okay. It bothers me, you know, like that's not just, that's not how we, that's not, that's not how we, we, we should be with, with each other. Right. So it really is changing the conversation and, 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 and being really honest um, as well as vulnerable, because the thing is, is when we begin to talk about this issue, men are going to open up about their own experiences of sexual violence or sexual abuse. And that is really, that's, that's just as important as like that we're acknowledging that we're believing that we're supporting um, and that we're allowing them to, de to decide who they want to tell, how they want to tell that story, um, and whether they want to do anything about it, right? Um, it's usually when boys and men come forward, it's usually much later in life, and um, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to hold the offender or offenders accountable. They might be disclosing the story because the offender is no longer living or they're no longer in the community where that offender is, or maybe the offender's in prison or, you know, <clears throat> it's just no longer no longer in their life. So it feels safe for them to disclose that to friends and family. And when they do, our job is just to really believe and to, to listen to them and support them. Um, but yeah, it just required, it just requires, you know, these kinds of conversations and, um, you know, whether it's an article, a podcast, a film, um, you know, a commercial, whatever it is, like we just use that to even within our own social circles to have those conversations not but it, it's also important for folks who are watching who are doing education who are doing prevention work um, in classrooms and in the community for them to use those tools to I mean just like you guys are talking about really to engage in those conversations uh, with with boys and men um, and, and you know provide examples of what healthy masculinity looks like right like just like let's you know like I we we we, we want to transform the culture and really call out the things that that boys and men are doing that they're actively engaged in they're supporting survivors they're volunteering they're donating you know they're 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 even if they're walking a mile in her shoe right like that that event of men sort of having the experience of being in the shoes of women and and raising money for a local rape crisis center on their college campus that's that's a lot right like that you know we're, we're those are the kinds of things that boys and men can do, um, you know, and just to have these conversations with each other. It's like, it, it's that easy. Um, and, and I think it's the most effective way of transforming the culture. And like I said, hopefully preventing or intervening um, in a situation where there's potential for sexual violence to occur. Um, whether it is, you know, like watching, you know, just being, again, an active bystander, right? Like when you're going out clubbing or you're going to the bar or you're going out with friends or there's just a lot of things that we can see and do in those, in, in those moments that hopefully we are, you know, could potentially be preventing an act of sexual violence or sexual abuse. Um, you know, those things are really important for us all to engage in. And um, it's not just the talking, but the actual action as well, you know, and I think that's been part of the conversations that y'all have had is that, you know, we have to move those conversations into action, um, into allyship, and 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 really show up for survivors, advocate for survivors, again, believe survivors, and I think that's the most important thing we can do. No, that was amazing. Thank you. Um, there's like two things that you talked about that like kind of really stuck. I, a lot of it was great, but two things that stuck out that like really like kind of like resonated with me. Um, one of which is when you kind of talked about just the understanding of like this spectrum of like the just yeah, this the spectrum of like sexual assault. How most people like kind of leave it off after like rape, like oh no, I didn't like rape this person. I could not have done anything wrong, right? But it's like everything leading up to that, right? Like them knowing that or. or them knowing, yes, that, that you are in power and that if they don't do something your way or the way that they might be hurt, that is also like sexual assault and harm as well. So I appreciate you talking about just like the lead up to it. Like it's so, and forgive me, I'm like a little younger, so um, my language is kind of off, like, but it's fucked no, up. You're good, so I don't know. It is. It's it like, is fucked right? up. Like how we, how we're just like, yep, nope, I didn't rape this person. So I could have not been in that circle, but it's like, no. And the way that I talk about it with the kids, because I actually work with young kids in this organization and I'm blessed to do so. Um, as I tell them anything unwanted, anything, I don't give a fuck what it is, anything unwanted, right? Because that's the thing too, is like we use sometimes like we use the words to like kind of to use it as a, a, a plane for, for victim blaming. 
Um, but I'll say no, anything unwanted, even if it's you putting your hand on their shoulder, anything that this person did not ask you to do is harassment, assault, bullying, because we'll talk about like assault versus bullying or harassment versus bullying. And I'm like, those are two of the same things, honestly. And anytime, anytime somebody doesn't want to do something for you, whether it's financially, sexually, physically, emotionally, and you make them do it or coerce them or force them to do it, that is also assault, harassment. So I really appreciate you just talking about the leader because like, I think communication and like uh, the wordplay is really something that like, yeah, it kind of fucks women over, right? When we don't talk about the in between, like it is in between and assault. Um, for her to know that she has to do these things in order to feel safe, that's definitely assault, whether you put your hands on her or not. Like that is definitely by far assault. Um, and another thing that I like, I appreciate it because I kind of like, um, I resonated that personally in my life is like, I love how you talked about um, just being a human and not having it all figured out. Um, I heard some aspects of maybe you saying that you have like perpetrated as well. And like me too, you know, I, I think like that's the most powerful thing in this world too. So one, I appreciate you for being open and, and talking about that. And it gives me room to be more open and, and vulnerable about those two, because like, I think it's, it's very powerful to talk about how you're not always having it found out and how you've also fucked up. Like I'll be like, yeah, yeah I was not perfect at all. Like I was somebody who was making women feel like they were less than making yep. feel like they were shit. So I appreciate that because like, I think we also live in a world where like, it's a flip of a coin. Like we don't see change. Like it really bothers me how we don't see change, right? We just see like good or bad. And it's like, no, I like to hear somebody who is now like established and is now working with people say, no, I am not perfect. I am not, yep. you know, better than you. I also sometimes, like I also was in the same learning experience that you was. Um, Cause I grew up, you know, in the inner cities of Bronx, New York, where it was nowhere near easy to understand or stand up for violence, like, or saw you were either a part of it or you were like kind of blinded to it, you know, to a degree. So. Um, I just, yeah, I appreciate that nonetheless of like you just being open and be like, no, like this is not always something that I've been supportive of. And I think that's the most powerful thing because then they can learn to be like, okay, I don't, like I really have people who I've dealt with that it's like, I'm just not going to change. Like, and I'm like, what did you mean? Like, it's a choice. You can, like, you don't always have to think the way that you think. You can actually like take the time, look at yourself, be accountable, be like, I'm not a demon, but I am a human who is fucked up. And now I'm going to choose to be better and choose to be um, to be supportive. So I appreciate that. Um, no, thank you for saying that, brother. I mean, I think that, you know, that's exactly, that's the, you know, that I, I think that's part been part of like uh, both my personal message, you know, my story is that I am not perfect. I've been engaged in the behavior that we're talking about. So, you know, I think when, when, when I, when I reflect on, when I think about my own behavior, my own relationships, they don't, they haven't always been healthy. I haven't always engaged in healthy behaviors, not, not just with, with girls and women, but with other men, right? Like I have a history, you know, I have this problematic history and everybody, you can, you can Google me and you can find it. You can find the details of that history. I have, and, and that's part of being accountable is, is, is disclosing and, and talking openly about my own abusive behavior. I think the, the, to, to your point, I appreciate you acknowledging and um, that it requires some vulnerability, right? It, it requires some risk on our hand, like on our part as men, especially when we get engaged in this type of behavior, specifically around sexual violence and sexual abuse, right? I think it can be really difficult for us to acknowledge that. Now, outside of the context of the law, right? Like we need to hold, like, we need to hold each other accountable because when it comes to sexual violence and sexual abuse, the reality is that most perpetrators, offenders, whatever we want to call those individuals that are abusing, they are never held accountable. They are never held responsible within the criminal justice system um, they, 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 you know, they're, it's, it's very difficult for, for victims and survivors to find justice within our criminal justice system around this particular issue, because sexual violence is, is about power. It's about controlling and, you know, it's an act of violence, right? And as a result, it, the, 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 the offender or offenders make it possible for the victim to never come forward out of fear, um, you know, for their lives, for the lives of their family and their friends, for their reputation, um, or because they've been, they, 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 they see that within our society, individuals who engage in that kind of behavior, um, who have made those, uh, you know, who have committed that kind of violence are never held accountable. And so um, it makes it really difficult for victims and survivors to come forward, especially boys and men, when, when the person, you know, the, the person who is abusing me is my father, 
and nobody's gonna believe me. Like this is the like this is a man who's well known, who's liked, who's loved, who's respected, who's you know <clears throat> go goes to you know parent teacher conferences, goes you know s- supports me on my games, right? Like that's that's how real it is. How like you know that nobody will believe me, and it's so difficult. Um, to, to collect the evidence, unless it's immediately after the assault, it, it's even more difficult to be able to collect that evidence because, again, all of that is done on purpose. Everything that the, the, the offender, the perpetrator does, intends to keep the victim from, you know, from disclosing the abuse, from, from coming forward, from reporting it to the, to, to the authorities. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it is really harmful and, you know, there's a tremendous amount of shame and guilt and uh, trauma that's wrapped up with with victims and survivors of sexual violence, and I think ultimately, um, you know, the 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 reality of this issue is that it, that's what makes it. You know, like we need to we need to have these conversations because um, the the impacts are um, last a lifetime, right? They they last a life, lifetime. People are living with this trauma. Um, and it's so difficult for them, you know, to, again, come forward to access services. Uh, and it's especially true for boys and men. I mean, I, I, somebody reached out to me about, to your question earlier, Felix, about the Latino community. Where, where can I send somebody, a male survivor that's Latino and Spanish speaking, right? Well, I don't know. Like, I, I need to, let me think about that, right? Let me, because, you know, when we even talk about communities, that are even more marginalized, then it, it makes it even harder for them to access services or to be believed or to <clears throat> get justice through the criminal justice system, right? So the, the more marginalized you are, if you come from a marginalized community, uh, if you're an immigrant, um, if you're undocumented, if you are a woman or, or man of color, if you are trans, like all of the, if, if you know, you're gay, bisexual, like, it, this marginalization makes it even harder for for those survivors to be able to access uh, to to be able to access services or to be able to again get justice. And so, um, it's this you know this is a this is a serious issue. It's a it, you know it's it, you know we we have to we have to have these conversations. And I appreciate you having those conversations with young people, especially about consent. Right, like we need to get consent for like in all of our relationships, especially those of us who are in committed monogamous relationships, like we still need, we should still, we should still get consent from our partners, right? We should still be able to have like consent is such an important conversation that we should be having with our boys from a very early age. I have a 13 year old son and I've been having conversations that are age appropriate with him since he could talk, right? So, you know, like just what does consent look like? right? Keeping your hands to yourself, right? Asking for permission before you touch someone, like, and also respecting his boundaries, respect, you know, uh, respecting his choices around his privacy, like, you know, uh, giving him permission to, because nobody gave me permission. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure many of you have experienced like being forced to, 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 uh, in the Latino community, we greet, we greet uh, family members, and this is not just Latino, but just not just in the Latino community, but we're we're encouraged to like kiss kiss the relative on the cheek, right? Physically kiss the our, our relative or to hug them, you know. And I was forced to do that. When I didn't do that, I was like I experienced like I was pinched, you know. I was yelled at. I was talked down to for not doing that because it offended my family member uh, because I didn't greet them, right? And so we completely flipped that on its head when we had when we had Joaquin and we went to family functions. Said you don't have to you don't have to do that. Like you you don't you, you don't have to go around and kiss everybody, hug everybody. Would to him were complete strangers, right? He didn't know them from Adam. Like he just like, you know. So so we wanted to ensure that he understood that he had the right to say no, and that in what to do if someone was to touch him or to say something or to show him something inappropriate. And that's true today as a teenager, like we're, we're still having that conversation, you know, with him now, especially now as he's, as he's sort of, as he's maturing and as he's beginning to get into relationships, right? So like, what does that look like? 
what, you know, and, and that looks very different from when he was a kid. So those conversations are should be ongoing uh, throughout our lifetime. And we as men need to have those conversations with each other as well. I mean, we, we need to have conversations about consent. We need to have conversations about what is appropriate, what is healthy, what is like, especially when it comes, you know, to to our sexual relationships, to our sexual behavior, right? Um, our use of pornography, all of those things, like, you know, we have to have really hard conversations with ourselves and with each other um, if, we, if we're really going to transform our transform our culture and really end sexual violence in our communities. I think it's, you know, it's, it's such an important conversation that we have uh, with each other, but it's also one of the hardest. So, um, you know, we, we, we don't have to, ha like, we don't, it doesn't have to be like hard. It could be, like I said at the beginning of this, it could be really just simple as sharing this, sharing this video with a man in your life and that's it. Like, what did you think, man? What did, what are your thoughts? Like, uh, did anything anything anyone said resonate with you? Do you have questions? Like, you know, I saw it, and and it's not just like asking, but just to your point, said I know about being vulnerable and talking about like, man, I really, like, oh man, I, I hadn't thought about that before. Like, I didn't know that. Like, that really impacted me. You know, I I, I you know, I, I have experienced this thing before. Or I have. A family member, a friend, a coworker, classmate that that has had this experience, and so I didn't realize how much that impacted me. Or, you know, um, so again, it's just opening that door and and opening. You know, this is a really great tool to have that conversation. So I appreciate the question, the comment. Yeah, wow. I'm just thinking like so many different things. Um, I can definitely relate to Serrano, uh, you know, what you shared about that, like not realizing some of the patterns and the habits that we have that we sort of learn kind of automatically in this society that is so patriarchal, that is so geared towards elevating men and masculine people and, and controlling and, and holding power over women and femme folks and non-binary folks. Um, and I'm also just really, you know, thinking a lot about my own kid who's, you know, four and a half. And that is something that we have also, you know, started to teach her early on. And that's, that's pretty simple, just that, you know, you can say no. Um, and it just happened just recently, you know, where we were over at my parents and, you know, grandma always wants to get a hug. And, um, you know, my kiddo is not super affectionate. And so, a lot of the time she'll say, no, I don't like that. Or I don't want that right now. And, and I think it does sort of feel like, oh, kind of like hurtful in the moment or like, you know, sort of we're used to just expecting kids to just kind of do those things. And then when we take a step back and, and really look at that, it's like, what is that teaching them about how they can show up in these different places in their life? Um, and then I think the other thing that I'm thinking about, and maybe this is a question, I don't know if I can phrase it in a question form, but something that I think about a lot as a queer and trans person, um, especially lately, is sort of this narrative and this story that queer and trans people and drag queens um, and drag performers are people who are perpetrating sexual assault, who are out there attempting to groom children um, and who are um, causing a lot of that harm. And I guess, yeah, maybe that is a question for you, Emiliano, like, do you see any truth in that? Um, and I think it's easy to say, you know, sure, this happens a little bit or, or it's all the time, you know, like we live in a very binary society where it's like, everyone's bad or no one is. Um, and so I'm curious what you would say or, or if that has sort of come up in the work that you do, um, you know, especially in a state where, you know, as you said earlier, they are actively trying to ban drag shows and and ban some of these folks from community. Yeah, Sean. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, wow. Yeah, that's it's in for, unfortunately a reality for many folks who are watching, right? That that's happening in their community, whether it's it's any marginalized from elected officials like saying that a particular community are rapists, right? Like we could, we, we could, there are unfortunately too many examples of people like in positions of, of power and who have a tremendous amount of privilege in our society that are saying <clears throat> that a particular group of marginalized people 
um, are, are, are rapists, you know, are dangerous, are violent, abusive, et cetera. That's not the case, right? The, 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 the research shows that that's not the case, that it's not a, a particular community. There isn't, there is no one violent race or sexual orientation, gender identity, et cetera. Like that's not happening in the queer community. Um, you know, that's, that violence is not happening by trans, trans folks. Like it, it, it's just, it's not true, right? Period. It's not like, there, there's no truth to that. Like uh, that isn't the reality in our communities. If we just, if, if we just take a moment to, to really even just look at the, the statistics of who is committing the, that violence. Again, it's, it's, it's predominantly cis men who are engaging in that kind of abusive behavior. And again, these are individuals who are known to us, who are family members, who are friends, who are loved ones, period, right? These are not, I mean, while we know and, and we have to acknowledge that sexual violence is occurring within institutions, these, are, these institutions have access to children. They have access to a tremendous amount of power. Um, they have a, they're, they're in positions of, of, of authority over children, uh, over other adults of girls and women, right? So the reality is that they are abusing their power. They're abusing their authority. Uh, they're abusing systems to, uh, to gain access and to, to abuse people. But again, the majority of, 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 of sexual violence and sexual abuse is, is happening by somebody that's with that's that we're living with. Like, let's just be brutally honest, right? Like, it's it's it's, it's happening within those relationships. So it's not happening at drag shows. It's not happening by trans people in bathrooms. It's not like it's not happening. It's it's not an issue within the queer community. While there is sexual violence in every community in every every place in this country. <clears throat> in all types of relationships, um, whether it's urban or rural communities, it's happening. Uh, in every state, it's happening. In territory in this country, it's happening. But it, I, I think, again, it's about, you know, the, the, the act itself of violence is impacting certain people more than others, right? It's impacting the queer and trans community. They're experiencing violence, not at the hands from their, from their community, from, ex, from outside of their community. So when we talk about the native indigenous communities in this country, the sexual violence is happening from people outside of their communities. When we talk about, like, you know what I mean? So when we, like, the reality of sexual violence is that um, it is occurring, but I think it, you know, the, uh, you know, it's become, you know, it, it's become unfortunately a part of some institutions. Like we have you know, the, the reason that we're talking more about male survivors of sexual violence is because of the sexual violence that was happening in the Boy Scouts of America, that the hands of scoutmasters, right, within that institution, then covering up, protecting those, those offenders, those perpetrators, and allowing them to continue to abuse other boys. Uh, the, the violence and abuse that is happening, that has happened within the Catholic Church, and not just now, even within the Baptist the, 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 you know, the Baptist church has come forward. They were doing the same thing that the Catholic church was doing in terms of protecting um, and moving offenders uh, of sexual abuse. So, you know, the, there's abuse happening within um, detentions, prisons, uh, and it's usually at the hands of the guards. It's not hands, it's not happening from inmates. While that, that does occur, most of the time it's those individuals who have power, who have access, who, you know, who, who are controlling inmates, uh, people who are in detention, whether it's law enforcement all the way through, right? So again, we can talk about like sexual violence and happening at, but you know, the, 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 that's just to, you know, to not take any risk. Like when we blame a particular group of people, a, a particular population, um, it is really to, 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 you know, to not really address the issue, not to get down to like the brass tacks of like, what's the root cause of sexual violence in our community? And it, 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 it is oppression, right? It is racism, it's sexism, transphobia, homophobia, like it's all of the isms that like that are that are that sort of, you know, the root of sexual violence, right? And I think if, if we don't, if we're not intentional about addressing those and having conversations and dismantling those isms, then we're never going to end sexual violence in our communities, right? In this country, uh, you know. So, so 
the, the this is a critical conversation. It is it is like we can't we can't avoid talking about it. We we have to deflect those people who like that's just not that's not the reality, right? Like if you if you really if you're really listening into and understanding communities, that's not happening. This grooming business is is it's heartbreaking. It's 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 super problematic. Um, it's it's rooted in racism, transphobia, homophobia, etc., sexism, all the things, right? So it, it really is a deflection of having really honest conversations about the root of this problem and about taking accountability and responsibility for for our role in it. You know what I mean? Like we we as men, collectively as men have to have like we need to be honest and open about this conversation like we need to well it may di be difficult to hear because again to your qu question and comment earlier felix i don't want to be perceived as a as a potential offender like a perpetrator like somebody who is going to harm um girls and women trans folks like any fo like i don't want to be seen like that i don't want to be perceived like that uh, just because just because of my identity right and so we have to again we have to acknowledge that we have contributed to the like to this, but we're also the solution to this, right? Like we literally are the solution. Uh, you know, we're, we have to be a part of um, the solution um, to 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 tending sexual violence, right? And I think, you know, that that's that's why it's important that you guys have these conversations. You know, like you guys are having these hard conversations, right? That really challenge folks' notions of their own identity um, and sort of like. The, you know, some of their behaviors, the choices that they're making, um, these ideas that we have about masculinity. I didn't ask for them. They, all of that stuff was like, you know, it was given to me. Like, you know, I was, I was taught to be, I was taught to have these ideas, these beliefs, these values, these behaviors, right? I was like, I saw men in my life engage. And when we talked about, to down to your point, that continuum, I saw men engage in that behavior. So I was like, well, that, that's just the way that I'm supposed to act. That's what I'm supposed to say to girls and women. That's what I'm supposed to do when I want to engage in, you know, when I want to have sex or, um, you know, when I want to get someone's attention, right? It's, these are all, you know, we have to, again, dismantle and like get rid of those things and replace them with really healthy behavior, you know, healthy ideas, healthy sexuality, healthy, you know, healthy, um, you know, like really learn what how to ask for consent. We like there's some men that don't know what even what that means. Like, how do I ask consent? Like, why do I even ask consent if I'm in a monogamous, serious, long-term relationship, sexual relationship where I have, you know, I have sex with my partner all the time? Why what why why do I need to ask for consent? Right? Why why do I need to check in with my partner? We all do. <laughs> like we all do. We should also expect the same thing, right? Like we should we we need to we need to ex we we should expect consent we should be asked for consent as well it's not just about like our part you know asking consent from our partner but our partner needs to ask for consent also and i think those are conversations again that we need to have that make it a much more like you know that make it these things less likely to happen so um yeah no this is a, that that's a that was a great question john and i it's painful um, to see that happening in our, in our communities and for for particular populations to be targeted and um, it's, it's it's awful. Yeah, I appreciate that that answer. And I mean, it's you know, it, I think what you're what I'm hearing from you very clearly is like we need to as men and masculine folks get really honest with ourselves and take a look at what we have done at how we have interacted with the folks in our lives you know i mean i know we're getting close to to the end of this time here together which is sad because i want to keep on talking with you um yeah. but you know like a, a very specific example came to mind you know for myself um when i was younger in like my mid-20s um i used to use the word rape in a joking way and that was something i heard from friends and and women and men um, in my life. And, you know, so, you know, oh, that car salesman really raped me on that price or something along those lines. Right. And it, it wasn't until a couple women in my life like stopped me and they said, Hey, this is a harmful thing that you're doing. And I don't think you realize it. Like, I don't think you're meaning 
to be harmful to us, but like, you need to stop saying that and using that word. And it felt awful in that moment to, to have that realization that I have been causing harm every time I've said that, you know, and, and we don't know who's in the room, right? We don't know if folks in that room have experienced sexual violence, have experienced other types of harassment or bullying as Serrano brought in too. Yeah. Um, and so it's, you know, it's like things like that, that um, feel really small, but in like the big scale of things, like it's like you're saying, those are the things that like step us up to get to that place where more of that, that violence is happening, you know, the physical and sexual violence is happening. Yeah. And so, yeah, just, um, has me thinking about, you know, my own story and in the ways that I have um, fallen short and have caused harm. And I also really um, think it's important because it's really easy to linger in that sort of shameful, mm -hmm. guilty place. But it's like what we're saying about like, how, how do we create this new normal? Like, how do we live into a healthier form of masculinity that is very conscious about that, that is accountable, that is, um trying to show love and care in ways that people want um rather than you know sort of just moving through the world not paying attention and causing harm all over the place and so yeah. um i will pause there and and i would love no, to thank hear, you, you know, thank you for sharing this huh? i appreciate yeah, it yeah and i think it's important that we share that and and that's a big part of these conversations too is like modeling it's uncomfortable. Like, I don't, I don't like saying that on here on live, you know, yeah. Facebook, but also like, I think that happens all the time and people sort of, again, just sort of, okay. It boys will be boys, all that sort yeah. of stuff. Locker room, locker room talk, right? Like it's, it's, right. it's normalizing the rape culture that we live in. I mean, it just like, what's the counter narrative? What's the counter message to that? Right. How do we talk about this issue? How do we talk about healthy sexual relationships? Like, loving sexual relationships, enjoyable sexual relationships, right? Like, you know, I, I think how do we how do we talk, have really important conversations about consent and what that looks like? And, um, and to your point, how do we model that, right? And it's just taking a risk and talking about it with our boys, like just like having this conversation with each other, right? With, you know, and being vulnerable in this space and, and in our daily lives and just like calling those things out when, you know, calling those things out when we see it and calling people in when they're like, and again, we have to decide for ourselves, what's the most effective strategy? Like in a situation where someone is like intentionally, or it looks like they're manipulating them or they're touching them or they're doing something where it's going to escalate to an act of sexual violence, then we do have, like, we do need to intervene, right? And I think that's something we as men haven't historically done or done well, right? We just don't know how, like, what do I say? What do I do in that situation? But I think ultimately it is the act of, of, of intervening, of saying something to that man, right? Um, not for, not for like the praise, you know, I'm like the superhero, I'm going to show up on my white horse. No, my, my, my job is to really, you know, to hold this man, I don't, whatever our relationship is, whether it's a family member, friend, a complete stranger, I'm going to talk to you, man. And I'm just going to like, you know, like, that's not cool. Like, I'm going to pull you aside. We're going to have a conversation. Not going to be like, I'm not, it's not going to be violent. It's not going to escalate into violence, but I'm going to let you know that that's not okay. Or I'm going to like, like it, how, how amazing would it be for us as a collective group of men to, to go and talk to that brother, like to, to intervene, to, to say something, to do something. Right. Um, you know, so, and, and to have a conversation, I mean, like, that's just not, that's not okay. Right. And not just us, but the institutions that those people are living within, like teachers and, um, you know, people like leaders in the faith community, like for those people to say sexual violence is unacceptable in this institution, within this organization, in this workplace, in this school, it, it's unacceptable. Right, and we're going to do our part to prevent it. We're going to do our part to intervene and to support survivors, um, and to hold offenders and perpetrators accountable. Like ultimately, whatever that looks like, and I think that can get us into a conversation around restorative justice. Because again, the behavior, the the behavior, I was held accountable for that behavior by other men and women, especially women of color, who held me to account for my abusive behavior early on. And who were part, you know, who were partly responsible for helping me transform and to understand. To your point earlier, Sean, 
it is usually girls and cis women who are like, you know, and trans women who are helping us understand that like our behavior is problematic, it's abusive, et cetera, right? It's not okay. And sometimes we need to be called out in order to be reflective and to change our behavior and to be for, for you know, that can be transformative and we can hold people to account without the systems. Like, you know, it's in a, like, that's an important conversation too, because uh, too many, too many men and too many masculine folks are being marginalized within the criminal justice system as well, because they don't have the same access to attorneys and lawyers and bail, et cetera. So, you know, they're not able to defend themselves, but, um, you know, so I think the, the reality again, is that we, we have a lot of work and have a lot of hard conversations that we still need to have with each other. Uh, and we need to transform all of the systems right in our, in our communities to so that victims and survivors, uh, well, that people feel safe, period. And that, you know, when victims and survivors experience sexual violence, they're able to come forward and they're able to get justice, whatever it looks like for them, right? And I think um, that's our mission here at TASA is to end sexual violence in Texas. And that work has to include boys and men and masculine folks. Like it just, you know, we, we have to join girls and women and, and you know, trans women, you know, uh, women folks just to, 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 in order to do that work, we cannot do it alone. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work to be done, but I hope that people will join us, that will join men as peacemakers, that will continue to, to join the network and be a part of these conversations. And, and again, share the, share, share them with the people in their lives and have a conversation today, right now. I love that. Do it. Do it right now. Yeah, do it right now. <laughs> or or tonight or tomorrow, yeah. you know, like over I'm over saying. dinner, over a beer, whatever, like, you know, like, you know, I think there's some a lot of really great resources. I did want to share one resource that really to your point, Sean, uh earlier about being a parent, protecting the gift, I highly recommend highly recommend it's a book for for parents, for caregivers, for teachers, for child care workers, like for everyone really should read it. It's really about the things that we can do to protect young people in our lives, right? That we can protect young people from violence and abuse, right? It really goes to the root of what you're talking about, of having those conversations with your children, um, having those those conversations with the people who are parenting who with you, you know, and and um and, and it's not just protecting my kid, right? My 13-year-old son is protecting all the children in my community. I'm gonna do my part to protect them because they are part of my community. We live together. Uh, we worship together. We, you know, we walk down the street together. We play together, etc. Right. So I am. I, I need to be able to do my part to protect the children in my community. Um, you know. And again, whether we suspect, we believe, we know that a child is being abused, we need to report that to the authorities. We need to intervene. We need to say and do something in that situation. That's so important because, unfortunately, children are killed every day. Uh, as a result of violence and abuse, they're experiencing a tremendous amount of trauma in their homes. Um, and, and that has serious, you know, it has serious repercussions for, for the rest of their life, for our community, for the well-being and the healthy safety of our communities. And so, you know, I hope I hope people receive that message and 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 do what they can to prevent sexual violence from happening in our community. It is possible, I believe. Definitely possible. And I know we are pretty much out of time here, but I do want to give Felix and Serrano just, you know, a minute or two Please. if you wanted to share any final thoughts. Um, but, you know, very, very grateful for you, Emiliano, and for the work that you're doing um, in Texas and beyond. Um, you know, we're here in Minnesota and, and so getting to connect with you and, and just building those partnerships is, is a really big part of this. So. Uh, Felix, if you wanted to chime in first. No, well, super grateful of the conversation. Thank you for bringing all this aspect, even talking about the root causes, important of bring awareness about sexual assault and how deep it's in our com in our communities. We see in our TV commercials, it's everywhere. So just to have the opportunity to bring it up, talk it, 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 it make a difference, not only to ourselves, but the people around us. So thank you for all the amazing work that you do, Emiliano. It's an honor for me to, to be here, to listen to your words. And thank you. I mean, you know, we're here. Anything we can support you, let us know. 
you're a role model. You're an amazing man. You're an amazing dad and amazing friend. So thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, and just grateful as well. Nothing but love sending to you. Um, it's just definitely dope to be in a room like with other uh, folks of color too that have kind of had the similar experience. Um, and just the motivation, right? Like anytime, like I think when you're doing this work, it's easy to feel alone for some reason just because of like, you know, whatever which is going on. So to hear like folks in Texas, anytime Florida, I'm like, damn, okay, all y'all data, if they get busy there, then I gotta continue to get busy here. There's no excuses, no if, ands, or buts. Um, so I appreciate that. And I just appreciate you being open. I think anytime I'm around a man that can be open, um, it just helps me to be more open in the future. So thank you. A lot of a lot of gratitude here. So yeah, thank, thank you all thank so you. very much. Thank you so much for for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. I I, I'm really, again, I'm honored and, uh, you know, I'm really grateful for the work that y'all are doing as individuals and as an organization. And I, I wish you, you know, continued luck with all the work that you guys are doing. So keep up the great work. Well, on that note, um, we just want to say thank you again to all of you who have taken the time to tune in, whether it was live while this is happening or if you're watching later on. Um, such an important conversation, especially to have with folks in your lives um, during this month of April, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, again, deep, deep gratitude, Emiliano, for sharing so much of your wisdom and experience with us so that we can learn and do better and hopefully like you said, that message is, is just gonna continue to ripple out um, into our communities. So we also wanna take a quick minute to thank our funding partners, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, as well as the Novo Foundation for all of their continued support in us hosting these conversations. Uh, we also want to invite you to join us for our next one, two weeks from today. We will be live for our 58th kitchen table conversation uh, and we will be having one more conversation about the Don't Buy It project. Uh, so definitely tune in, uh, learn more about that. It's a prevention curriculum that's designed to prevent and, and really end commercial sexual exploitation. So we'll talk a little bit about that in two weeks. And don't forget, of course, if you haven't already, like our Facebook page. You can find us on YouTube and watch all of our 57 conversations now if you want just just queue them up and and we would love that um yeah and as always we hope that everyone takes care between now and our next conversation you can reach out to us anytime with the men and masculine folks network we love to connect with all of you and if you want to come on and be a part of one of these conversations in the future we certainly are are excited when we can have uh, friendly guests join us and just share what they're up to in community. So thank you again to all of you. We hope you take good care and we'll see you next time.